There is, uh, if one were to use the, 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 the phrase, the war inside Islam, there, there is a war inside of Islam. It's not a traditional war, but there is a war inside of Islam. And this is a very complicated war because some of it is still uh, shaped by the legacy of colonialism. Uh, and this is not simply to throw there because we want to talk about colonialism as much as colonialism left the Muslim world very, very weak. Uh, it left few institutions, but uh, it left the Muslim world very weak uh, and dependent. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is the issue of the war within Islam is part of that conversation about modernity that still, go, go, uh, still goes on among Muslims. It started in the 18th, 19th century and still goes on. How we can modernize but not lose all of identity as Muslims. And here when they say, when people in the Muslim world say we don't want to lose all our identity as Muslims, it doesn't necessarily mean that we want to be religiously fanatic. Uh, but they, the emphasis is that to maintain some part of this grand culture of Islam uh, still relevant uh, and nevertheless uh, modernize and become like uh, largely the model that is being followed is the West. Uh, and because what you have is uh, serious crises that are taking place in the Muslim world, this seems to be like an open wound. Every time you think you have, uh, possible, you have possible remedy to cure it, it opens up again. Uh, so in the 1950s, 1960s, and some parts of the 1970s, uh, one ideology that was extremely popular in at least the Arab world was Arab nationalism. Uh, there were other forms of uh, nationalisms elsewhere, but Arab nationalism, for instance, uh, posited for lots of Muslims a possible way out from this uh, uh, problem of modernity. It didn't work, and that reopened this thing. What should we as Muslims do in order to uh, resolve this uh, inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans. So it is, the war in Islam is essentially this kind of question that still revolves around what do we need to do in order to catch up and join the civilized world on equal footing. Uh, the Salafists uh, propose that we don't bother join this because this is a, an alliance of heresy, an alliance of, uh, made by the devil. And if we join it, essentially, we compromise everything that's good about Islam. We should fight it. And this ideology started to uh, be proposed by uh, scholars in the 1930s, such as Al uh, Abu al-A'la Maududi of, of uh, India at the time, who became later a major figure in the religious thought in, in Pakistan. Uh, but also it's proposed by the likes of uh, Sayyid Qutb in the 1960s in his book, milestones. Uh, and there are plenty of other scholars that promote that kind of line, uh, which largely we could today uh, identify with Salafism, is the only way for the Muslims uh, to resolve the problem of uh, the clash with modernity is to take it uh, directly and fight, fight it. Uh, but the majority of the Muslims are not of that opinion. The majority of the Muslims want to join the rest of the world on, on equal footing, uh, but still maintain some kind of elements of their own culture so that they can be proud of their own identity. And that is hard to resolve given the variety of crises that they still experience, from uh, economic crises to political crises. And this is not something that one should blame the Muslims for. Uh, and this is no more the issue of colonialism, but still part of what we broadly call Western hegemony. Uh, largely, rulers of the Muslims are imposed on them. You know, th this is a reality that we have to uh, accept. They, uh, we look at someone like the president of Egypt, uh, or the way today the West reacts to the crisis around the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And you see how uh, the Western politics vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world is all tied to the economic interests of the West. Um, 
So England passes rules not according to uh, the principle of human rights, but to the principle of what is best for English economics. Uh, the same with the United States. And the, the great thing about Donald Trump is the fact that he says things the way they are. He doesn't hide uh, the way other pre American presidents uh, used to do. Uh, he said that Saudi Arabia is a huge economic lifeline for American economy. Therefore, our politics is determined by that. Uh, but then we shouldn't take what happens in the Muslim world as something necessarily uh, only generated by Western politics, but we shouldn't take Western politics out of that. So what we see as part of the war within Islam is preconditioned by a lot of things that are not possible to change. Uh, and we cannot uh, expect the Muslim world to resolve its problems as long as they don't have the right to choose their own leaders. Uh, we don't like, we like uh, democracy in France, in Europe, in the United States, but we don't trust democracy in the rest of the world. If we l allow the Egyptians to vote for their own candidate, uh, we are sure that that person is gonna be someone uh, not to our own interest, and therefore we sabotage that. We sabotage that with the Palestinians. We sabotage that pretty much with every leader of the Muslims. Uh, so how do we expect not to, fee, not to see a war within Islam if we are not allowing the Muslims to resolve their problems on their own? But again, there are serious issues otherwise, and they relate to uh, this kind of problem because we propose the Western model as the only model for a civilized nation, for a civilized group of people. We didn't... Uh, when, when modernity came, it didn't propose different ways to be modern. It only proposed the Western European model as the model to follow. And that created a crisis pretty much everywhere. This crisis is not in, only in the Muslim world. Anywhere else we look, we see the same kind of crisis. Uh, it is that kind of crisis of the sole reference point in terms of modernity. Uh, there are other questions, and the Muslims unfortunately are not given credit for a lot of changes that they have done. One of which is the fact that the Muslims have done serious modernization, serious reformations in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, often we glance through that without giving them any acknowledgement. In pretty much every Muslim country, we have a very advanced legal system and constitution. Uh, some of these constitutions, for instance, they ban slavery, they ban polygamy, they ban, uh, they give equal rights to man and woman. Uh, obviously, there are other conditions that don't allow for these uh, uh, laws to be put in full practice, some of which have to do with the political climate overall. But we know that also Western ideals don't function fully in Western societies. If you take United States, for example, polygamy is still practiced in some parts. Uh, there is no equal uh, seriously equality between uh, races, let alone between the sexes. So th there is lots of, we take the best out of the Western culture and we compare it often to the worst part of the Muslim world. And we conclude on the basis of that, that people in the West are the best and people in the Muslim world are the worst, when actually things are much, much more complicated than that. I, I don't want to sound defensive here as much as point to the historical realities that the war within Islam is partly uh, a war preconditioned and exacerbated by the fact that there is one sole pole that we are all pulled toward, and this is European pole, and that's only going to cause problems because not everyone wants to be European. Two, there is internal issues that need to be resolved by opening up the political life uh, and uh, allow for much wider practice of, uh, of uh, political democracy. And that cannot be helped if we still sell all kinds of weapons to dictators to keep killing and ruling and, and sabotaging democracy in the Muslim world. Uh, and we should also heed and encourage uh, all kinds of overtures that we see in Muslim countries uh, by different groups. For instance, Tunis uh, proposed to pass a law about equality and inheritance between uh, a man and a woman. Uh, that's something that we see, this is something that not because they are feeling any kind of fear uh, or because uh, 
they are not good Muslims. That's because actually they are practicing Islam in a very, what we could call, traditional way, being creative. The great thing about traditionalist Islam, that is the Islam of the tradition, rather than the Islam of a golden age, is that traditional Islam always tried to aspire to answer the problems of its own context by being original, by being uh, very inquisitive, and by being very dynamic. That's trying to take everything into consideration in order to come up with a ruling that would be advantageous for the situation at hand. And the Muslims have done a lot of these things. And the proposal to create equality between a man and a woman in terms of inheritance is one of those things that gains a lot by appealing to traditionalist Islam, to, by appealing to a notion in traditional Islam that uh, uh, often we call, uh, we, we, we call the purpose of Sharia. Uh, uh, that is, what is Sharia after all uh, seeking? Is it seeking to force the Muslims to something or to ease the life of the Muslims so that they can be uh, and practice, they can be good Muslims and they can practice Islam uh, properly. So this uh, uh, notion is very operational in traditional Islam. It doesn't have room in essentialist Islam. Uh, so we, we need to look at the kind of diversity that uh, we find uh, in Islam. Uh, mm -hmm.